But again, our passage today reminds us of what it looks like. Even when it seems as though someone's living in defeat, that victory is still ours to live. Again, our king has won, our victory is assured, but now our duty as heralds, as ambassadors of Christ, is that we ride into the fray of a broken world, fraught with the tension and pain, and we proclaim good news and herald this in hostile kingdoms. Well, I'm gonna invite my reader this morning, Jacob Haynes, to read for us as we, you guys, we're at the end of Acts. This is it today. This is a little, it's a little bittersweet for me if I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm excited and also always sad to close a book because it's the last time I'll ever read it. I'm just kidding. You keep reading these. Never, never know. All right. There you go. Good morning. Let's stand. We're going to jump around a little bit today. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then we're going to jump to Acts 28 the very end. All right. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, for the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And let's go to chapter 28, starting verse 25, halfway through. It's the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. You may be seated. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we do come to the end this morning. Um, and as we do today, um, and as we begin today, uh, I actually, I want to start where we normally end. Um, I want to start with communion, um, which I... I, I I know it's like, we've, we've got a pattern. So why, why, would, why, why would we mess this up? We've got a good thing. But I, I want to I start with this reminder, uh, because so often when we speak in terms of church, we can think of it in terms of, of brick and building. But what we need to remember is that it is built on the body and the blood of Christ. It's his death, his burial, his resurrection that has brought all who follow him life. And so this morning, I just, I want to start there. I want us to pause. I want us to reflect on that truth. And I want to, I want to take into account all that's transpired this week. And you can take that a number of ways within your individual life. The pressures, the, the misses, the many things that you have felt the opportunities that, that you chose something over Jesus, or you just need to, to come and, and reorient yourselves. You look in our community, and there's, there's more fires and more things happening around, or if you look at the world around us, it can start to feel so overwhelming as to what is happening. And so we need to stop, and we need to pause, and we need to remember our, our need of him, and we need to begin today with our need of him. So I want us to start with the bread and quietly calming our hearts before him. We remember that Jesus is our good king, that he has come and he willingly gave all so that we might have life in him. So let us take of the bread 
and let us remember. As we take of the cup, we are reminded of his blood covering our sin, covering our shame. That he offers us forgiveness. He offers us hope even in the midst of the tension that we see all around us. So let us take of the cup this morning and remember the hope that is found in Jesus. Let us take together. Father, we begin... We begin with the offering that you gave us in your son. We begin by proclaiming the truth of his life, death, and resurrection. That our hope for all eternity is found in him. We are reminded of the words of Paul that this is a trustworthy saying, deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost and each of us, Father, has felt that. Each of us has felt the, the flaws in our being, the, the decisions that don't glorify you, that are not of you. We, we've experienced that. And as we come to the table, we are reminded that you overcame on our behalf. So Lord, we fix our eyes on you this morning. As we come to the end of the book of Acts and we recognize our beginning in the midst of it. And so we pray all of this to the King of ages, immortal and visible, the only God, and to you be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. For almost a year now, we have been walking through the book of Acts. And almost a year ago, I began with an image that has always stuck with me of Old Kirk, an old church that's found in the heart of Amsterdam. It's currently now in the heart of the red light district. And I share this story often because it reminds me of what so easily can happen when we forget the body and the blood of Christ, when we forget where our hope lies. You see, this church is this beautiful building that once stood as a beacon of hope, a stream of living water, making much of Jesus in all things. It was a part of the movement of God. At some point, it became a monument no longer proclaiming the hope in a place that desperately needs to hear the hope of Jesus. Now it's just this monument, this museum that you can go and hear of the past, but it has no present. And as we've been working our way through the book of Acts, what we have seen throughout is that we are invited into the movement of God, not just there and then, but in the here and now. That what we see activated within the church, what we see empowered by the Spirit in the book of Acts is available to us this day as we step into the movement of God, heralding the good news that has transformed each and every one of us who has called upon the name of Jesus. Now, we've seen that this doesn't come without opposition. No, but this comes with a a boldness, a a prayerfulness, a community-mindedness, a unity under the banner of Christ. And as followers of Jesus who are empowered by the Spirit, we're called not to a bunker faith, not just to hold back and hold the line, but we are called to advance the kingdom by living the kingdom showing something that we cannot find on our own, but is found only living under the king of kings, Jesus. See, when Jesus came back and he spent 40 days after his resurrection with his disciples, he spoke of the kingdom so much so that that passage we just read in Acts 1, verses 6, the kingdom was on their mind. They said, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 
And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. See, Jesus isn't just deflecting this question. He's not trying to avoid the answer, but he's, he's making something clear that you're not wrong to ask about the kingdom, but let me focus you on what's important in front of you right now. See, the Father has the times fixed and set. And we want to know, but nobody knows except the Father. And so we continue to live faithfully in that time. But Jesus focuses them. He says, listen, what matters right now, what I want you to pay attention to right now is that you will be my witnesses. That you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be heralds of the victory that I have won. Even when that victory is not felt. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, in in ancient times, when a a battle was won, there was often a herald who'd be sent from the battlefield, that he would ride away proclaiming, good news, we have won. Now, the victory had been completed in that moment, but it was not yet experienced by the town people that were awaiting that herald. Until they received that news, they had no idea just how good things were. And I love this image because for so many of us, as we go through life, that's what we see in the experience all around us, that Jesus has come, his victory complete, and yet so many have yet to hear the good news that he has won, and so they're still living in defeat. But our part in the kingdom is to proclaim what he has done. But what we also see is that some hear this good news and they reject it. They, they refuse to hear it. They, they want to continue to live in the, <clears throat> the kingdom of old, under the banner of the kings of old, because it's, it's safe and it's what they know and it allows them to pursue the ways that they know. But again, our passage today reminds us of what it looks like Even when it seems as though someone's living in defeat, that victory is still ours to live. And I think this is a a, a tension that we experience today, a collision of kingdoms and kings in all of our hearts, the already and the not yet. Again, our king has won, our victory is assured, but now our duty as heralds, as ambassadors of Christ, is that we ride into the fray of a broken world, fraught with the tension and pain, and we proclaim good news and herald this in hostile kingdoms to reluctant recipients in our our families, in our communities, and to the end of the earth. But how do we do this when it seems there's so many things that come against us? Where do we even begin? And so we pick up today in our final section of the book of Acts, beginning in Acts 28, verse 17. If you remember last week, Paul was put under house arrest. And now we pick up after that. In verse 17, it says, After three days, he called together the local leaders, Of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. I want to stop here and I want to go back to that first phrase. After three days, Paul is put under house arrest. After three days, what does he do? He calls together the local leaders of the Jews. Paul is is consistent throughout the book of Acts. He he can't go out to the synagogue as was his normal mode of operation. And so instead he invites the leaders, the Jewish leaders to come to him. It's always something that he has proclaimed. It's always something we see lived out. In in Romans, he reminds us it's to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. He sees the promise of God in the Hebrew scriptures. And so he's going to go to the Jews first and then he's going to reach out to the Gentiles. And so he continues that pattern here and he calls together the local leaders. 
Again, calling them together, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And so Paul calls together these leaders after three days. So he's quick. He's not wasting any time. But he wants to set the record straight with them. He's not sure what they've heard, what they've been told as to why he's there, the charges that have been brought against him. He's assuming that word has come all the way from Jerusalem about this Paul who's arriving in Rome. And so he wants to set the record straight. He wants to speak to them and tell them, listen, I've maintained my innocence after trial after trial from from Felix to Festus to King Agrippa. There was no warrant in the charges. And he even tells them the reason I I, I appealed to Caesar is he knew that to face the, the Jewish tribunal, that he was not going to get a fair verdict. But again, verse 20, he said, For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you all and to speak with you all, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And Paul can throw a good hook into anything that he says, and and he gets him right here. He says, I want to be clear with you that these charges that were brought against me are false, but I can tell you why I'm here and in these changes, because I'm speaking of the hope of Israel. Right then and there, they're thinking the hope of Israel, the consolation of Israel, as, as Simeon would say when he received Jesus in his arms, the consolation of Israel, the hope of Israel, the Messiah that was to come. You're speaking of these things? That's what's brought you into these chains? The Jewish people had been waiting and waiting and waiting. And here Paul is is giving the opportunity to speak to the hope of who Jesus is, but he's rooting the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures so that he can pull his brothers along as he points them to the kingdom of God that has come. And once again, we see what Paul so often does is he, he builds a bridge. He, he, he creates this common ground on which to stand. Verse 21, and they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you, but we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against And so what Paul discovers is in his his haste to move towards them, they haven't heard anything yet. To his relief, they haven't been tainted by what anyone else is saying, but their curiosity comes around, what is this sect, this way, this offshoot, this way of Jesus that people keep talking around because it's making everyone crazy and everyone's spoken against it. So can you give us a little bit more detail on what this is? And so verse 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So they pick a day and they all come over to Paul's house. Remember, again, he's, he's got a Roman soldier with him at all times. He can't go outside, but he gets to hang out inside. And so anyone can come and visit with Paul. And so this great group of people shows up. And from morning until evening, he expounded to them. He explained. He exposed to them. He testified to them, witnessing to them about the kingdom of God, trying to convince and to persuade and to have them put their confidence in Jesus. And he sought to do this all through the law of Moses and from the prophets, using the Hebrew scriptures, painting the story that God had been telling his people since the very beginning, saying it has been fulfilled in Jesus. Now, again, this is nothing new. I mean, this is the culmination of so much of what we see. And even when we read the letters of Paul, we're, we're often taken aback that he so deeply roots the coming of Jesus and who he is in the Hebrew Scriptures. Because for Paul, the entirety of Scripture points to Jesus, that Jesus alone is the hope of all humanity. And so he presses in on his, his brothers here, expounding, convincing, testifying, Because this is what it means to be a witness of Jesus. 
that all of life becomes a living testimony to him, that we're able to expound and convince and live as living testimonies to the hope that we have in Jesus. This means that not only are we as individuals within this room ready to give an answer to the hope that we have in Jesus, but we're we're also ready to live out that answer in our hope of who Jesus is. Just this week, I was sitting with a couple who was sharing their, their ministry across the globe and how God is just doing incredible things in and through them. And, and, and one of the, the main emphasis they have is really to disciple the next generation of, of, of people who are local to where they are, and, and they're raising them up, and, and they're, they're living with them and alongside them. And, and they said it was interesting that one person that they'd been mentoring for so long was seeing kind of this connection between what they said and how they lived. But when they experienced the the loss of a, of a child, that's when it came alive to this mentor, mentee. Because they said, you, you, you don't just say these things, you, you live them. Even in the depths of your grief, you still have a hope in Jesus. And they said, yes, because in our sorrow, we find strength in him. In our pain, we still trust in the promises of God. It doesn't mean that there's no weeping. It doesn't mean that there's no sadness. But it means that we have a hope that does not waver. And when our words match our actions in our lives, even in the the hard seasons, we're living as as a witness to the goodness of God in all things. And this is how we see Paul living his life. Jesus is not an option to him. He's not one of many. No, he's the only option for hope. He is the answer. And so Paul is laying this out with an urgency. And he shares this using the Hebrew scriptures and the response that he receives in this moment. Verse 24. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. Some were convinced, others disbelieved. And they leave disagreeing among themselves after Paul made one final statement. Now, what's the final statement that he makes? Well, it packs a punch. The final statement he begins, he says, The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they could see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Now, if you want to create a divided reaction among the Jewish people, you point that word right at them. You're saying that we're not hearing, that we're not understanding the scriptures that have been spoken over us for so long, that this word is now going to go forth to the Gentiles. And some are seeing this connection, they're making the connection, and they, they see that Jesus is the fulfillment of this, and others are going, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not following you. Now, if this passage feels a little familiar to you, uh, that means that you're reading along with us. It just so happened this lined up this week in our, our daily readings that we were reading from Isaiah 6. Now, uh, if Isaiah 6 sounds familiar to you for for other reasons, that's because it's been the topic of a lot of conversation in our news outlets over this last week. Because President Biden used Isaiah 6 in a speech that he delivered as he spoke of the military saying, here am I, send me. Now, just, just a quick aside here, because I think there's something for us to pay attention to in this. Whenever scripture is used in a, in a public platform by one of our presidents or by, one, by a politician, we need to pay attention because presidents and politicians have been co-opting scripture for a long, long time. And why do they continue to do this, to kind of twist it to their context and their means? Well, because oftentimes it works. Because oftentimes we're not paying attention to how they're, they're using it. Sometimes we just let it slide or we go along because at least they're mentioning Scripture. See, this is why it's so important for us as the people of God to be discerning, to be in the Word so we have the full context for ourselves, so we understand the passages that are being pulled from. 
That's why I encourage you, if you're not in the word every day, get in that practice. Get in that practice of taking in the word every day so you can begin to inhabit the words, know the words, so that when they're spoken, you're, you're not just kind of going, oh, I think that sounds right. Now, there's a, there's a danger when the, the language of the kingdom is, is co-opted. And so often our politicians and presidents will do this because they want to become our king. And, and far too often we're, we're ready to give them the crown. But when we know our scripture. When we read it for ourselves, we keep our eye on the kingdom and the true king, Jesus. Because if you take Isaiah 6 and, and you just rest there for a little bit, before Isaiah ever said to the Lord, here I am, send me, first he said, woe is me. Because he came into contact with the wonder and the holiness of God. And God, in his graciousness, reached out to Isaiah. And it was only then, after God did the work, that Isaiah was able to say, here I am, send me. A message that seems more appropriate as we continue to, to witness the world and the mess around us, that more of us need to stand and say, Lord, here I am, send me as your ambassador. But, but back to the passage at hand, okay? Just a quick aside, because it fit in what we were looking at. Isaiah 6 9, and, or 6, 9, and 10 are used here, speaking of a people who will hear but never understand, see but not perceive, a people who are dull, listless, and lifeless, refusing to see the truth because their eyes are closed. But I love that even in this passage, the Lord says, but should they, they see? Should they understand? Should they turn their heart towards God that he says he will heal them? This is the beauty of our creator. This is the beauty of God's movement towards us that when we repent, when we turn towards him, he receives us, he heals us, he forgives us. That's why we started with the body and blood this morning because we need it. And he meets us in that moment. And so if you're willing to turn, God will meet you there. But Paul also understands as he's using this, that the salvation that's being offered is also often rejected. And even the words of Isaiah, the salvation that was offered to you, is it's now being sent to the Gentiles. They, they will listen. And no wonder they were in disagreement. Again, hard words for any good Jew to hear when they're directed towards you. Whenever the words of the prophet sting you, pay attention when God's convicting you with those words. The words would feel appropriate to, to so many who still reject Jesus and his kingdom and his way today. So I, I do think there are many who hear the word of God and they just kind of brush it off. They just choose not to see it because when you see it, when you experience the goodness that you are called into, you also have to understand that it comes at great cost. Jesus doesn't want just part of you. He wants all of you. He wants you to jump in fully with both feet, but so many hold back from that truth. So many come into this room and they hold back from that truth of giving all to what he is calling them into. But here again, Paul is giving yet another tipping point to his audience, to the people that he's speaking to, an opportunity to accept or reject the word of God. And just as Paul lays out this invitation to the Jewish leaders, so Jesus continues to lay out this invitation before us. But what do we do with this invitation? Do we put it off to decide maybe tomorrow? Or do we finally give in to the greatest gift that we can ever receive? See, this, this is what, what Paul is continually an ambassador for pushing towards in the book of Acts for more and more to step into the kingdom of God under the rule and reign of Jesus. And there's an urgency that he carries within himself. And it's an urgency that I feel like I'm starting to recognize a little bit more and more and being confronted with more and more just in, in conversations within life and within perspective. Because we have no idea how much time we have on this earth. We don't know. We make a lot of assumptions about it. 
we always assume tomorrow. See, Paul lived in this way that there is never this assumption of tomorrow, that he was always living, proclaiming this truth with a deep urgency. And it's, it's shifted my thinking of as long as there's breath in my lungs, Lord, may you use it to, to your glory today. Even Jesus, when he taught the disciples how to pray, he said, Lord, give us our daily bread, not our, our monthly bread, not our yearly bread. Just give me enough for today. We don't like that prayer. I want to know what I have tomorrow. But Lord, today, would you give me enough strength to step in where you have me? Would you give me enough presence to pay attention to those who are around me? Would you give me the ears to hear in the conversations that your spirit is prompting me to step into? Lord, would you use me here and now? But, but we have to choose this day. Not, not tomorrow, but, but this day. What am I going to do with this good news? Am I going to embrace it? Or am I going to reject it? Now on to, to verse 29. Oh, wait. If you're reading from the ESV, you may be noticing for the first time right now that there is no verse 29. There is a verse 30, though, that can feel a little confusing. So what's happening here? If you're reading from the ESV or if you're reading from the NIV, you'll notice there, there's not a verse 29. If you're reading from the NASB, you'll notice that it's in brackets. And if you're reading from the New King James, you'll see that it's there, but usually there's a little asterisk or a little small number that leads you down to a footnote. So this is just a little, you know, aside because we're here, and I think it's helpful for us to understand what's happening in our Bible when a verse is missing, because uh, that can feel a little disconcerting. This is, this is a translation issue that, that comes up here. See, verse 29 is found in some manuscripts, some of the early Greek manuscripts that we have, and there's, there's a great number of them uh, that we have. With full confidence, we can, we can really say, man, we, we are, are very close to the originals in so many ways from what we have available to us. But what they do is they take the, the best, the earliest, the, 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 the kind of the cleanest copies, and we look at all those and we compare those copies if we were to just say right now, hey, I want you to take notes verbatim of what I'm about to tell you, and everyone in this room, right, the next things that I say, I want you to write down word for word, and we took all those together, we might have a couple that vary uh, in, in how they, they wrote something down or how they, they scribed that across the way. But having this full amount of us, we could go, oh, that was, that was a mistake, but clearly this is what was supposed to be there. And so verse 29 is seen as a, as a scribal addition, uh, meaning that, th that we see this in a, in a few of the texts where it looks as though someone's trying to explain the reaction of what was happening in this conversation, but it's not seen in the majority of the texts uh, or in some of the earlier texts, and so it's, it's left out. That means that most likely it wasn't meant to be there, it's just added in there. All right, I know that's a long-winded way of getting to that answer, but I think it's important uh, that we don't just skip past those things. It's really easy to, and I know sometimes I'm the Bible nerd that loves to like, oh, let's geek out on this, um, but it's important for us to understand what we have in our hands, and when something's not there, if it looks different, um, I think it's an important thing. So, verse 29, that's our explanation. Moving on to 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. These final two verses of, of Acts, they give us a glimpse that Paul for, for two years, two years was under house arrest. Most likely supporting himself, he had to live at his own expense, most likely supporting himself either through, through his trade, doing some of his tent making, or through the gifts of others that helped to provide for him for two years. He'd already been imprisoned in Caesarea for over two years, awaiting a trial there, and now here again, as he stands to wait, uh, await trial before Caesar, is another two years. But what I love in these moments and what we learn again in Paul is that uh, the waiting is not wasted. He continues to invite people over. He continues to write letters that we are still reading to this day from, from this uh, home imprisonment. 
what we would often call opposition, Paul is just like, oh, here's another opportunity. Paul welcomed, it says, welcomed all who came to him. Anyone who wanted to sit with him, he was going to talk with. And what was he going to do? Well, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. See, the book of Acts begins and ends with the same theme. What were the apostles talking to Jesus about before he ascended into heaven? They were talking to him about the kingdom. And what was he telling them? I don't, I don't want you to worry about the details of that. What I want you to worry about is that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, proclaiming my kingdom to all that you encounter. And what do we see as the bookend here at the very end? That now Paul is proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the kingship, kingship of Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. The very thing that Jesus was saying, this is what I want you to be about, is where we see ourselves finishing. And we come to what feels like, in many ways, an abrupt ending. But really, this ending is more like a beginning. See, a couple things to pay attention to. The, the story of Paul can feel incomplete here. I mean, we've, we've been with him through a, a shipwreck. We've been with him through trial after trial after trial after trial. And now we don't get an ending here. Like, there's no resolution, it feels like. It actually can feel a little frustrating. But, but it's important for us to recognize Paul is not the main character of the book of Acts. This is the continuing story of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit in and through God's people. So again, we end where we began. The disciples were talking about uh, the kingdom, and his response was, you will be my witnesses. And now we're ending in Rome as Paul is proclaiming boldly the kingdom of God and teaching about Jesus without hindrance. And here's what I, I, I love is that when we take this in terms of history and Rome, the power of its day, no one could foresee the fall of Rome, and yet Rome is no more, but the gospel continues on. And we have this image of Paul in chains under the control of Rome thinking, oh, he can't do anything, but he's boldly proclaiming the truth of Jesus without hindrance. And without hindrance, we continue to boldly proclaim the truth of who Jesus is because the movement of God cannot be overcome. Though trial and tribulation and opposition may come, the people of God, empowered by God, proclaim the good news of the kingdom with their lives and with their words, and, and that will not stop. But again, it says without hindrance. What does that mean? It means that Paul, even in chains, was, was free. Was free to proclaim a better kingdom even in the midst of the kingdom of, of Rome. It means although he was captive, his heart was always more captive to the kingdom of God and proclaiming that truth that it would not stop him no matter the cost, eventually, according to church history, leading to his very life. The book of Acts is not just church history. It's not just biography or, or story. Sometimes we can just think, these are great stories. The book of Acts chronicles the continuing work of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, empowering and equipping his people. The apostle Paul is a part of that story, but he's not the main character. And we see as he gets caught up in the work of God, radically transformed for the purposes of God, and he lives his life as witness to the good news that Jesus is king and that his kingdom is available now we see this movement of God carry forward. And we see this movement of God that has reached throughout the centuries up into us now, but the, the work of the church and the work of the kingdom and the work of Jesus is not done. See, I believe this is the call for us today, the invitation before each of us today, is to step into the movement of God, to bear witness to the good news of Jesus, that he is alive that he is king, that he has come, and we await his return. But in the meantime, we don't just stand around. 
Let's not fixate on building monuments, but let's join in the movement of God, following in the ways of Jesus, living as living testimonies to his work in our lives, making much of him in all things. See, my prayer when we began this study and my prayer now is that it would never be said of us as a community and as a people of God that we are interested in monuments, but know that we would be a part of the movement of God living as witness to his goodness in Auburn and Penn Valley and Lake of the Pines and Grass Valley and Nevada City and Yuba and beyond and to the end of the earth. But again, it's easy for us to say this. It's easy for us to nod and go, yeah, no, that's, that's what we should do. But this morning, I, I want us to take this a step further. I want us to commit to this as individuals and as a church family. But how? Well, it, it's simple. Uh, I want you to stand up and sign your name and renew your vision for God's kingdom here and now. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you are an ambassador of Christ. You are a part of the work of reconciling the world to him. You get to participate in that movement, each and every one of us. We're living testimony. We are witness to his goodness. So my prayer is that we would lean into this truth, that we would ask God to empower us to be a force for his good, to be a light where we see that it's dark. And wherever you are in your neighborhood, in your town, in your workspace, in the lives of those around you, that you would be a living testimony to the kingdom of God. Now, as someone already told me, that was a really helpful distraction you put in front of us this morning with maps. These maps represent a portion of the places that we live. Now, I'm just going to go on the offensive here. I know some of you are going to be like, my house, I can't find it. It's a little bit off the map. That's okay. You just write at the edges to the end of the earth, right? (laughs) But what, what I want us to do as a church is not just to talk about this. Not just to come in on Sunday and feel excited about, but intentionally think through, Lord, where do you have me? Where are you using me to boldly proclaim to be a herald of your kingdom to the end of the earth? And maybe that just starts in your neighborhood. And so I'd ask you just to come up, sign there. Maybe it starts in your workplace and you just sign there. Maybe it starts in the broader community. Do you sign there? Wherever God has you, be present and allow him to use you. But step into your days, your weeks, your months with intention to be a herald of his good news. It's easy to get lost and to feel defeated when we look at the kingdoms surrounding us, but our king is still on the throne. He is still active and moving. He is still alive and well, empowering us through his spirit to be a force for his good that more can come to know his name. So may we as a church boldly proclaim this truth in our lives and in our actions. And so as we conclude service this morning, we're going we're gonna to finish with, with a song. And as the worship team comes out and begins, I just want to invite you, as you feel led, as you are ready, we've got some Sharpies up here. You just make your way down and you just sign where God has got you planted. He wants to use you. And may this become an Ebenezer, a, a signpost, a tangible reminder that the end of the book of Acts is our beginning. As together we commit to live without hindrance, heralding the good news, stepping into the tension, and boldly bearing witness to Jesus in your neighborhood, in your workplace, and in your community. And to the end of the earth, we proclaim the kingdom of Jesus. So as you feel led, come and put your name where God's going to use you to proclaim his goodness to the end of the earth. Father, that is our prayer, that your spirit would be poured out, that your good news would transform, that more and more would come to know the hope that is in you, the everlasting hope, Father. God, we we pray for revival. We pray for renewal. 
But God, we know that 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 can't happen unless you're renewing our hearts, unless you're reviving our souls. So would we start there, allow you to speak to us and then obediently follow wherever you lead. Lord, these these signatures, may they be a, a sign of our intent to make your name known. That the hope we have, we do not hoard, but we take it with us as living testimonies in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Father, would you stir in us? Would you move in us to boldly proclaim without hindrance the hope that is found in you? We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we conclude this morning, um, if you need prayer, we will be down front. If you, if you want to talk around Jesus, if you want to get a Bible, we've got, we've got Bibles available for you. If you just have more questions, we'd love to sit and talk with you around that. But as we leave from here today, the, the end of Acts really is our beginning. This movement does not stop. So may we pay attention to where he has us placed. May we step forward living boldly for for his kingdom, bringing light where there is dark, hope where there is fear. May we trust in him as ambassadors of reconciliation. May you go this week in his grace and his peace. God bless you. I'll see you next Sunday.